Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, the prime focus of this uh, talk is uh, on what we're doing with the Chester County Beekeeping Association. What we've achieved and what we hope to achieve. The uh, slide that we have over here is the slide of the seeds that we deliver to our members. So one of the projects that we do is we purchase bulk seeds. We get, well if you're at the store and you get seeds, you get tiny little amounts of it, we buy in pounds, okay, and we select these, and this is one of our members with uh, her seeds planted uh, in front of her beehives over there. So we sell maybe about 25 pounds in a springtime. That is a huge quantity of bee seeds, uh, and the bees um, uh, uh, enjoy it. We change it slightly every year to what they want, okay? So let's go in. Um, education and training. At the Chester County Beekeeping Association, one of the things that we realized was that the, um, the beginners were often neglected. If you come into a club as a beginner, you'll find people talk a different language. You've been beekeeping for many years, and what happens is that you hear all these strange terms and nobody addresses you. You come in, you lost, you come into one of these meetings, and you leave. Okay? You don't return, okay? because they're all crazies. <laughs> they talk strangely. Okay? But this over here, we started a beginner group. It is something that one of you could start up very quickly. We were very fortunate, and somebody that we selected um, um, uh, perpetuated this. This over here is um, somebody in our club called Michael Langer. So he started this. And we said, please go ahead with this. Just use it. This is what we do. We, um, we have 80 members just on the beginners group. Okay, 80 members. <laughs> so uh, the total members we're dealing with probably about 335 at the moment. So 80 of those regard themselves as abject beginners. We've got to the stage now where we think we should have a newbie a <laughs> group that's for absolute, absolute beginners. So now we've got beginners and they feel as though they're better than the rest and now we need one called a newbie. So, but this is amazing. I mean, uh, they copy what we do. In other words, they do many versions of what we do. So we do it as a main club and we'll have a lot of projects and they copy the things that they want to do. So they go on their own and we obviously go with them. Okay, so if they want somebody a little bit more experienced, we go with them and uh, they have great fun. The, the number and the amount of emails going through is phenomenal. Uh, I try not to get too involved with it because <laughs> obviously if something's really wrong, then uh, I come in and uh, say what my, my bad view is. Anyway, the next that we'll have is um, looking at the APRI site. Now you mentioned this early on. The apiary site, I think, is one of the most important things in a bee club. Uh, we have a meeting this Saturday um, uh, that uh, we will have a beekeeper here on site. Anyone, anytime can come to the beekeeping apiary site. We currently have two hives there. Uh, this will be building up over the, uh, over the year and over the winter, and uh, we'll just be accumulating hives. It serves multiple purposes. This is going to be our queen rearing location. Okay, now we will say uh, what went wrong with us and what went right with us. <laughs> uh, to get a bureaucracy to be able to say yes is incredibly difficult. Okay, this is on the Cheslin uh, Reserve. Okay, uh, the Cheslin is a huge farm area that uh, was uh, donated to the Natural Lands Trust. So uh, we use their facilities for our monthly meetings. So uh, they have been outside, but they have got a covered roof. It really is a beautiful modern building. But on the far corner, they um, eventually, after the, I think this is the fourth attempt at a location over a span of six months, we chose this one uh, that is way away from everyone else's weddings and funerals and whatever could possibly be affected. Now, these are our members over here. We managed to get a tractor. We put this uh, fence around. We put on the shed. The beehives, unfortunately, I didn't have a photograph exactly of that, but uh, the beehives are right next to us over here on two long um, uh, uh, um, hive stands. So it can accommodate maybe 10 or 12 hives. So they're right next door to Al. Al uh, uh, erected the, the shed. He was determined to get it done. Okay, so that's the... the um, 
the, the site. Um, this over here is another project that we went on. Unfortunately, this project was not sanctioned by our members. Uh, what this over here was hive dipping. So our officers regarded this as being too dangerous. Okay. Now, this is pioneered by the Australians. The Australians do hive dipping. So you can see this is one of our older members. Uh, this is John McIlvain on his farm. His family has been on that farm, and it is in the center of Exton. Okay. Uh, his, uh, he was one of the, his family was one of the original uh, holders of the land, uh, the Thomas family. And uh, he's now, um, well, <laughs> God, he's a McIlvain now. So um, uh, it's a very, very interesting farm. And we erected this, it's a huge tank. And this tank over here uh, is molten wax. There's a certain recipe that you use with rosin and wax. So what you can do is you can come along and we dip hive bodies into this molten wax. From your hives lasting that duration, they can last now for 20 years without painting. You do not need to paint them. If you want to paint them, you can. Immediately when they come out, you can put a coat of paint on if you want to have a, the, the, the paint on, the white paint or the green or the purple or the pink, whatever your fancy is. But once it's set, it's dried, you cannot paint on it. You pour water on it, uh, it's just amazing. It just drips off. It's just uh, off a duck's back. It's, it's a brilliant. Uh, we soak them in here, totally submerged, for um, 10 minutes. So we bring the temperature up to a certain level. We hold it at that. And you can see the gas burners that we have down below. Uh, obviously, we've got safety equipment and all the rest. But you can see all the hive. And we can do a remarkable amount uh, in a short t a space of time. All new woodenware. You, uh, the main benefit with this is old woodenware. The main benefit with this, if you tell us you've got old uh, woodware, you bring it in. Because what is the major advantage with that? Why would I be dipping old? No water. It's dry. That's dry, but what is the main reason? What, what is the worst thing that happens to your bees? It gets in all the crevices, but what is the worst thing that happens to your bees? Disease? What disease? American fowl brood. Okay, that's exactly. American fowl brood, this over here is one of the very few mechanisms beso besides irradiation that kills American fowl brood. So the heat actually denatures. American fowl brood spores will last for uh, 70 years, if not more. Uh, so if you're buying old woodware, just be very, very, very careful. So this is one of the main reasons. It soaks into all the little pieces and uh, very, very good at preserving the wood. So, um, yeah, that's uh, one of the options. So that's what we have. So we periodically uh, schedule it. Uh, I would say, say schedule, but uh, we'll say schedule. So I've got to become Americanized. Apologize for my accent. It is from uh, Alabama, so I apologize. <laughs> this over here, library books. Uh, one of the things that we do at the club is we have something called library books. Okay. Uh, we have found, now you are just starting this out, we have found that these become less popular over the years. Library books have not been a success recently because people have something called uh, YouTube, smartphones, all of that. So these over here, we are dragging around a lot of books that many of them are not being used. Okay, so we're trying to think of something digital, we're trying to think of something more useful, we do have the people using the books, but not as much as before. Uh, it is something that, that is hugely time intensive and uh, maybe back intensive as well when we're looking at uh, <laughs> these. So it's something, look at the, the future trend is not using books. So uh, try to think of an imaginative way of, of coping with it. But we dragging maybe, um, maybe 150 pounds of books uh, around with us every meeting. So it is a lot of... Um, uh, it's a lot of work, and somebody who does it <laughs> has to be quite dedicated. Next. This over here is um, what we do at meetings as well. We've just introduced this. Uh, this is what we have as a, a chance to get rid of your old equipment. So what we have here is what we term the flea market, uh, as in a flea market. Um, you've got old equipment. You're moving from 10 frame to 8 frame. You've got stuff that you want to sell. It takes up space in your basement 
takes up space outside, it looks, yeah, and your wife wants to divorce you or whatever because it looks so untidy. You can get money for it. So all you do is you bring it over, you pay $5 to our club because we want to get very, very wealthy, and you sell a whole lot of things. So this over here is, is a really, really good, uh, good way okay, of uh, getting rid of your items. Over here we have t-shirts. Again, I'm sure you have t-shirts. You probably all have them. One of our areas that we're looking at over here is what we stand for, for the club. And uh, this over here is a beekeeper. A uh, beekeeper is somebody who has the bees that survive over a winter. They're beekeepers. The ones that kill the bees over the winter are bee havers. Okay. So you're not allowed to wear the shirt if you are not a beekeeper. So it tries to encourage people to do the right thing uh, over the winter time. Okay, so there we are, t-shirts. <laughs> um, there we go. Uh, that's my daughter, by the way. <laughs> so it's, uh, there we have next. Uh, this over here is something we do right early on in, in the season. This is what I do at my home. So um, we go to all the uh, folk and we say, any beginners that are starting off, Please come, we'll show you how to assemble the stuff, okay? Because it's quite daunting. There are a lot of little tricks, like that strange little nail that you, that you put in that prevents the frame disengaging when it gets really gummed up, okay? Things like that. It takes very little effort. But you'll th see, three years later, uh, you try, oops, uh, uh, just the top bar comes out, the rest stays down below. And it's correct, those little um, nails that go inside there, how to do it. Make sure that these are right angles, okay? Uh, make sure you use glue and all the necessary things. So we try to give a date on this. So February the 22nd, that's when you can't do anything else. You go and assemble all your woodwork. Okay. So this over here is, we're going through the time of a year. So we're just trying to give you an idea of what we do. So that is a hive assembly. Next we have a grants. Okay. What we do is we give money to our members, or maybe even others, if they have bright ideas or they want to do something. The first one that we have is um, Don Coates. Don Coates is a retired vet. And he's fallen in love with his microscope. He also has fallen in love with beekeeping that he's done for many, many years. He has combined the two and he goes and does diagnosis of everything on your beehive. He will look at the bottom board, he looks at this, and he does incredible amount of research. So he has got a grant from us. So identifying the nectar sources from your honey, all of these things. Nasima, he's coming out with incredible ideas on Nasima. Do we treat for Nasima? Do we not treat? Um, and these are things that, uh, that he's looking into. The other one is a Tesla Bee Supply. Um, that is one of our members as well. That said he's going to breed queens. And he's going to give five of those queens to our members. So he produces queens. He gives them out. And that was his. And we gave him a grant for it. Yes, go ahead. Go do that. Next what we have is just pollen. Go to the next one. This tells us roughly when the pollen comes in. So if you want to look at maple pollen, we take photographs of it and we try to isolate when the pollens are. Uh, we know that this is a wind pollinator that's uh, probably not nu very nutritious. Maple is beautifully nutritious for honeybees. Okay? This over here, we also do things to our members. They probably get tired of us. <laughs> Uh, because we send surveys through to them and say, you know, how are your bees? What did you do? Did they survive? We ask weird and wonderful questions. And we say, what would you like us to do? Because we make money. Okay, we have lots of members. We make money. Okay, we need to spend the money. So what they said is how to start nucleus hives. So we did a whole session on starting and managing nucleus hives. They say working with beeswax and making wax. That is one of the things we're going to do in the winter time. That's probably not that important in, in the normal flow times that we have. One of the areas we covered was preventing swarming. Okay. If you can prevent swarming and you have a reasonable area, I maintain that your bees can deliver 100 pounds per hive. Okay. If you can prevent the swarming impulse, you can get over 100 pounds per hive. Okay. So how do you prevent it? What is, what is the approach that you can do that? 
Remember that a lot of the people don't realize that their bees uh, are in the process of trying to swarm. So there are very uh, interesting techniques that we use. We use different modified uh, demery techniques. Uh, extracting and bottling your honey. So we ran um, workshops on how to extract your honey. Um, and uh, this over here, hive checks, um, like the hive crawl particularly popular with something that we make a name that's called a hive crawl. We'll show you this later. A hive crawl is when we say, okay, who wants to have their hives inspected? And we'll have six, seven, eight, nine, ten volunteers. We put them on Google Map. We draw the quickest route between all of them. And we go on a convoy, much to the annoyance of normal drivers. And we go from one place to the other, all of us following like little lambs, going through, and we go and we take apart somebody's hive when we say, you are useless, or <laughs> whatever we <would> say. <laughs> so this over here is called a hive crawl. People really like it. They talk about this for, for, for weeks afterwards. Um, then beekeeping courses as well, and trees and seed. Uh, so those are some of the things that we do. Uh, this over here is one of our main events of the year. This is our conference, CCBA conference. We try pay money for the best speakers that money can buy. Okay. Our last uh, conference, or the beginning of this year, our conference, we had two of the greats. Okay. The greats were Michael Palmer and Tom Seeley. Uh, these, Dr. Tom Seeley does uh, honeybee democracy and how the bees make decisions with the swarms. Absolutely fascinating. The other one is Michael Palmer, which I think most of you know. You've looked at him on YouTube. So we invite the best of the best. We pay them money, we bring them in, we get a big auditorium, and uh, we, we give the beekeepers what they want. Next. This over here is just some photographs. We had the beginner section <laughs> was Dr. Larry Connor. The beginner section. Okay. The beginners. Okay. So you can see the caliber of the guys that we're bringing in. Uh, you can see these are the books. These are his books that he's written. So one of, I think most of you have read his books. <laughs> and he's uh, only managers on the beginner section. So here we have, uh, these are our door prizes. Just an example of some of them. Full hives, eight frame hives, loads and loads. The door prizes are better than the state beekeepers by about fivefold. You go in there, this is brilliant. Okay, we put a lot of effort into what you can get. Okay, <laughs> hive tools. But you get a Merrill box, you'll get um, a chance of getting loads of things. Okay, so very, very nice. It is expensive to, uh, to go to the seminar, uh, but we believe in giving quality. Okay, so you're prepared to pay your $60 to get in there. You have a very good chance of winning something and actually remembering uh, some of the speakers that you went to see. Okay, the next over here, just a, a simple... Um, uh, photograph of some of the members at this conference. Next, uh, this over here is our Don Coates. Uh, he runs a, a, a little uh, lab session where he shows you what it looks like. What, is, uh, what does the pollen look like? What is the pollen from different types? Uh, what does a Nesema look like? And he's uh, busy with a slide and his microscope and all the honeys. And we also invite vendors. We get them to pay us to be there. So that is Man Lake. Man Lake is now fairly close to us, and uh, they were the first to offer the free shipping. Traditionally, we would be going for Brushy Mountain. Uh, they refused us this year. They didn't want to come down to our one, and uh, it was quite interesting. So we have about, uh, we have about 10 different vendors, from um, uh, Miller B to a lot of the big players over here, and uh, they display their wares. So you can buy things or order through them for that. Next, uh, this is the auditorium. Let's go back one, sorry. Uh, this is the auditorium. Uh, um, okay, so this is the beginner session. This is the auditorium that we were in. This is the advanced session. We have even got a bigger room for this coming year. So um, this over here is uh, just presenting at this stage. Uh, we superimposed uh, our own logo <laughs> onto that uh, screen. Next. Um, this over here seminar, uh, just in a brief illustration. Next. Okay, what happens, um, people say that the Bradford pear, now we feel as though they've planted too many Bradford pears around, but we do find that the bees like it. It okay. uh, doesn't produce much nectar, they're building brood the 22nd of April, that's on the flowering date that we have here. 
So beautiful trees, but and the bees do work them. It is an important part of their strategy. The traditional beekeeper would, would say that you get nothing from it, but you genuinely do. Very nutritious pollen and so on. This is over here, another photograph of the same thing. The next over here, swarm season. Okay, now we try to give dates. We try to publish the dates of when you find um, swarm cells. Now I'm going through at this stage, which is about April the 20th, I'm going through all my hives once a week. So I'm going through about 50 plus hives every week. And uh, we're looking at swarm cells. And what do you do when you see swarm cells? Uh, what is your approach? What do you do? Okay, and uh, these are the debates that we will uh, have. Dandelion, um, this is April the 27th. Now remember, we're slightly cooler than I predict what you are. You would probably have this a week earlier than these dates. Okay. Next. Uh, swarm, uh, we try to predict when the swarming is. Please remember, this is incredibly important. The first swarm will probably be emitted when the drone hatches, plus three weeks. Okay, try to remember this. This over here is really, really interesting. Because if you predict when the swarms come, it makes your beekeeping so much more fun. Okay, uh, I was one day out this year. So one day out this year for the first swarm. What you do is you look for um, drone cells. Okay, you look at the drones that have been laid. Okay, and then you calculate. Drones 24 days. Okay, so the three days for the egg, and you can tell what age the larval stage they capped, and you can tell what it is. You work from there to when they hatch. Okay, when they emerge from the uh, the pupils, uh, pupa stage, what happens is it's three weeks. After that three weeks, that is when the drones are fully mature and it coincides exactly when you'll have your first swarm. So uh, that is uh, very useful. That worked for us. Uh, unfortunately, that was my own swarm. Uh, this over here is our, 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 own, our old location. Uh, this is our old location for, the, uh, for one of our meetings. This is one of our uh, informal meetings that we have. It used to be done at the Stroud Preserve. And uh, yeah, next. This over here is just uh, our previous bee inspector, just showing some hives. This over here is uh, an important addition. Now, this year we elected to get a, what is last year? Last year we got a, a, an extractor. Okay. Uh, it was deemed it was too dangerous to get an electric powered extractor. Now, I feel very strongly about this is because when I started off, I had no money. Okay. Nothing. So I used to have to go borrow an extractor. And it was a huge ordeal for me because when I started beekeeping, I couldn't drive a car. Okay. So I had to get somebody to drive to get it and uh, then I had to pay them and so on and so forth. So uh, I spent a lot of time and effort getting this and trying to arrange an extractor to extract my honey. I primarily dealt with uh, chunk honey. I used to sell chunk honey. Uh, because I didn't have um, uh, extractors readily available. And it's hugely intensive. If, you, if you're dealing with uh, comb honey, it is very, very um, expensive on the bees. The bees take a long time to make it. So, uh, but it is the best honey on earth. It is absolutely wonderful. Um, May the 11th is uh, Iliagnus. Um, Iliagnus is the Russian olive. It's one of our prime nectar uh, plants that we have in our area. It is uh, invasive. Uh, don't chop it down. It's good for the bees. Uh, and don't notify the neighbors at that nice bush. Uh, it's a scraggly bush. You'll see it all over. Okay, next. What we do, one of the primary things that we do, one of the most important things that we do is from the grassroots level. And this is what we try to encourage our members to do, is plant trees, plant wildflowers, plant things that are nutritious to natural pollinators and your honeybees. So what we do is we go to some of the huge nurseries and we buy 200 trees at a time. We buy them three years old, normally on average about three years old, and they cost in the region of $1.50 per tree. Okay. Now at a nursery you'd be paying over and above $12 for the same. These are what they call bare root trees. And we get them and we redistribute them to our members. We even subsidize this. So we select the best trees. 
Now, the amazing part about this, the really, really interesting part about this, is that most of them are bought by our older members that will not see the benefit of these trees. So um, it is really, really interesting. So what we do is uh, we look at little leaf linden, uh, silver leaf linden, and uh, American, um, that's the basswood. They are very, very good bee trees, and they fit in the gap when we start our dearth. Okay. The other thing that we do is sumac. Sumac is in the dearth period. So we're trying to fill the gap when the bees... So this sumac, the staghorn sumac, sirewood as well, although you need a certain elevation with the sirewood. Um, black locust is our premier... Uh, it's almost like a weed. I think most of you get most of your honey from the black locust. And... Uh, Please remember to plant it. Uh, it can be an attractive tree if you look after it, but it is probably the majority of the honey that you get. We are now doing hive scales, electronic hive scales. When a black locust is flowering, our bees are gaining about 12 pounds a day. Okay. Black locust is not flowering, 3 pounds a day. Okay. Uh, it is so blatantly obvious. It is blatantly obvious. The latter half of the black locust flowering is when the major flower is. But it only flowers for a short duration. It's, it's, not, um, it's not much. So the, this is a linden tree, characteristic shape, uh, uh, often called a bee tree. The other one that I would like to add onto the list, but uh, <laughs> is the, uh, I think, uh, um, um, Peter Lindner probably expressed this as well, is the BB tree, the Korean BB tree. I would plant loads of those, but it is exotic. So, uh, <clears throat> but they are phenomenal. They fit in exactly the time when our bees are struggling for nectar and pollen. This over here is the same slide that we had in the beginning. <coughs> Excuse me. This over here is the, um, um, the plants, uh, the, the physical seeds that we sell. So this is where we buy 10 pounds, uh, 20 pounds, 25 pounds of uh, seeds. So this is our wild flower mix. For a club, it is absolutely amazing. You buy it and you just package it into Ziploc bags and you sell it to your members. And it is a fraction of the cost of what you would have if you bought those little seed. Um, we had it, I think somebody worked it out, it was 20 times cheaper. 20 times less expensive for these seeds. So this is absolutely brilliant. And these are members going in planting. And the more we can plant, the better it is. Because this will, your bees will pollinate it. It will form seeds. And lo and behold, it will continue, even in a, 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 a distance away from this. So this over here is incredible. Here we have uh, some more photographs of those flowers. And we also do other ones as well. We do um, a yellow sweet clover, white sweet clover, and uh, the Dutch clover, the one for your lawn. So we will distribute you this. You pay $2. You can do your whole lawn of an acre almost with $2 of that beautiful white, uh, uh, the, the Dutch clover that we have. Okay, next. Um, this over here is a swarm. Uh, this is one that I picked up uh, <laughs> sitting on a clothes line over there. It formed a very, very nice uh, uh, colony later on. So it was a marked queen. So I thank whoever left it. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Another thing that we do, this has worked very well, is a swarm list. You know, you get free bees. Okay, you put your name on a swarm list. But when somebody calls you, it is 20 miles away. Okay. This over here is what we post on our website. And we make a Google map. So if somebody lives over here they will phone that person there. Okay. Uh, and if they live here, they will look to see who the closest person is and give them a call. They click on that and it gives the phone number, who to contact, what they deal with, and free removal of swarms. Free bees for you. Okay. This has worked incredibly well because if somebody gets a swarm, they want to notify somebody quickly, they can get in touch with them. So this is a nice initiative here of a swarm list. It's a link, uh, very easy to do. You just put everyone's address. You get people to pay you money, and uh, not the club. You pay you money to put their name on the list. If they don't pay you money, you make sure the link doesn't work. Okay? You can make money yourself. <laughs> oh, we've got the video on. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, this is this year. <clears throat> this year, yeah. So those are exactly this year. But uh, 
<laughs> you have to have the Google. You can go look at it on our website. This over here is a black locust, our premier bee tree, the black locust. Uh, <clears throat> we've been debating for a long time as to what is the best one. We try to get photographs of bees on the black locust, and it is pretty difficult. It is pretty difficult because the, there's so much nectar. The bee will disappear into the flower, and you wait with your camera. <laughs> you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and then it's off back to the hive, and you've missed it. Okay, it's just gone. Okay, so this is really difficult to film because it's virtually a one-stop. It goes into one flower, stops, back to the hive. That is a distinctive flavor. On your honey is a distinctive flavor. I can taste the honey and say, black locust. Okay, this over here was taken over to Europe. Okay, uh, the black locust here in America has, a, uh, I think, a borer or a parasite that causes it to misshape. The, when they took it to Europe, they didn't take the borer with. <laughs> so this is called the acacia. Okay. This is acacia honey. So if you go to Europe, uh, uh, the scientific name is pseudoacacia. So uh, this over here is one of the premier uh, bee plants in Europe. And uh, they go crazy about the, the black locust, the acacia honey. Okay, next. Uh, this over here is an illustration of the weight gain on the hives. So we tabulate this. We put this onto a Facebook account. You can go look at it. This is the primitive way that we had of doing it. We did a hive scale. So let's go. And that is the hive scale over there. That's Chris, one of our members, weighing the hive. Okay. So you can see he's got one of these old. You can pick one of these up for about $100. So please look around for it. Very, 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 very useful. Okay. But we went a step further. Okay. With our club, we said, who wants to come with a bulk order of electronic scales? So what we did is we organized with the, um, with the supplier of electronic scales. And we got a, an ele electronic scale for $200 that will record every five minutes of your hive and how it is gaining and losing every five minutes of the day. Send it through your wireless router, then through onto a web page, and you can look at it on your cell phone wherever you are. Okay. <laughs> you know when it has swarmed. You know when it has swarmed. There are no excuses now. Okay. And you can tell swarming when they're going to swarming behavior because the latest ones they sell have two weight measures. So you can compare two hives. If one is gaining and the other one is static, it might be they're doing swarm preparation. They're looking for a new home. They're not gathering honey. Okay. This over here, now this is the Dutch clover. This is what we sell to our members at reduced cost, at what it costs us. Okay. Uh, and we, we even might subsidize. This is one of my apiary sites over here. Um, and uh, there is the, the blanket of Dutch clover. Now, the reason why it's so dense here is because the bees have pollinated it. If I look the other way, you'll find that this is very sparse. Okay. Because the closer it is to the beehives, the more they pollinate it. Okay. So this becomes very dense. You can always tell when you're passing an apiary site. Go past an apiary site in springtime. You'll see more dandelions. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because they pollinated it so much better. So you can almost find apiary sites by looking at the, the flowers in the area. Okay. This over here is a very, very important thing that we established is the mentor list. Okay. This is started by one of our members. Uh, when I started as the president, we said, we have to get this going. What happens with every bee club that you go to, there are a wealth of beautiful ideas, but nothing ever happens. Okay, nothing ever happens. doesn't happen. So they've been talking about this for years. Okay, so I said, we do it. Okay, they accuse me of being steamroller. Yeah, I don't care. Okay, I will steamroller. This is good for the club. We just do it. Okay, so what we did is we had uh, Charlie Hall initially take this. And uh, what I did is I produced this on a map over here. So everyone, it's blue and red. So you know exactly who's prepared to be a mentor and who the beginners are, and you match them up where they are closest. So you can go in. So a beginner over here is the blue one, so they will contact that person there, and you match them up. So when you've got a problem, you've got somebody to call. You've got somebody close by. If you've really got a major problem, you can pay them money, and they can come visit you. But this has been incredibly successful. This has gone on and on and on. So a mentoring system is something that works well. 
Very often you want to ask that stupid question, but you don't want to stand up in a crowd to ask the stupid question. <laughs> you rather have a single person to ask the stupid question and then pretend it's something else. Okay. So this over here, mentoring system. Over here we do a lot of outings. Okay. One of the best things we do at the club is we go to apiary sites and we will say, okay, we're going to be here at this date and a lot of us dress up like this over here. Look at these strange gears over here. Uh, and you can see the, be uh, the, the beginners over here because they look pristine and white. Okay, <laughs> pristine. <laughs> then you'll see the, the ones that look all like they haven't been washed for a few weeks and that year. And then it looks like, uh, yeah, somebody does some bee work over there. Okay. Next over here, <clears throat> what we held is a photographic competition. Okay. In the club, we said we will give you $50 or $100. I can't remember um, how much, but uh, how much was it? hundred dollars. Okay, it's a hundred dollars is a difference. And these are some of the photographs that came out. So our members post photographs and this is Al. He's in charge of our, um, of our apiary site. So he's really good and that's his daughter. And uh, a delightful daughter and uh, she loves bees. So you can see the kids getting involved. Next. Uh, you can see the excitement on the kids faces. I mean this is, this is why we beekeepers. The youngsters, look how they enjoy themselves. Look at this. You capture that on film. It's brilliant. Next. And there's uh, another kid there. Uh, the, the amazement at these bees. They will remember it forever. Okay. That, this is absolutely amazing. And uh, next. Um, this over here is just a, uh, installing a package bee um, <laughs> on, on his site over there. So... Uh, <laughs> And this is the winner of the competition over there. So um, this is Dan's daughter, and uh, she genuinely was pulling that. <laughs> she genuinely that, and it genuinely is filled with bees. There's no, no crooking with this one. That was dragging her to a new apiary site location. So uh, there she is, all dressed up <laughs> uh, with the skirt as well. I'm not sure whether the beekeeping outfit is actually correct for that, but uh, that won the prize. Okay, so... Um, and we have lots of these, uh, these getting people involved with it. Okay, also what we do, we had a demo, as we mentioned early on. This demo over here is by our, um, uh, Jim Curtis. Okay, so Jim Curtis over here, I love it. He wrote this. It wasn't me over here. Uh, you'll also be able to see how a tightwad managed to build, he's a university professor, uh, an extractor, an uncapping tank, mostly from the stuff he found in his garage and basement. <laughs> Uh, it will be low quality, largely sugar water, but bring a jar if you want some. So he had a great time with his homemade extractor, and uh, he showed everyone how it did. But he needed to have four people to hold it down. Okay. That was the, the problem. He managed to extract, so it was a, a huge amount of fun. Okay. Next we have just an interesting fact. This had our Facebook maximum number of hits on our Facebook. I think we had, um, at this stage, we had over 700 just looking at the snake. The snake was very interesting. This is a what type of snake? Garter snake, Garter snake yeah. And uh, it is eating bees. Strange. And uh, this over here, which was so fat over here, this is my beehives. I've got 14 beehives just to the left of it. You can't see those. But it got itself stuck on the fence. Now, I saw it. It wasn't stuck for long. It, it retracted. But it sat there for a long time. <laughs> I had to touch it a bit to see whether it was uh, okay, and it then back, uh, so it stuck through there, and then it came back out. Um, so uh, I was amazed it would strike at uh, living bees and, and eat them, but uh, I even went back and tried to photograph, but I couldn't see what bee it was trying to get at. So any bee that fell off the landing board, it would try and go for it. So um, interesting. Um, this over here, we have a picnic. Uh, about the 8th of June, we hold a picnic. Um, the picnic is just a get-together, fun. We get all the club members uh, together and we have an auction. So we sell anything that anyone doesn't want. So we sell huge amounts of stuff. It is really good to get rid of it. They donate it to the club. So it is really, really nice. Uh, this over here gives an impression of where we are. This actually looks fairly similar, but a little bit smaller than our Cheslin, our new um, summer um, area. But notice the kids over here. Everyone brings food. We have a great day over here. Okay. This over here is just a uh, photograph of honey. <laughs> this is what we do a lot of beekeeping for, is to get the, the honey. So this over here is just a little photograph of, of honey that we've got. 
the different size bottles. This over here is one of the premier. This has got the American record, is the Linden Tree. The Linden Tree is the American record for honey production, um, was from a, a Linden Tree float. So uh, <clears throat> we, that's the ones that we sell. Look at the tiny flower. Uh, look at the shape, the heart shape of the leaf and so on. This is a Chinese chestnut. It shows you the bloom periods as we go on. This over here is June the 22nd. Already we're starting normally a dearth period now after the Linden. And uh, this is just uh, Johnny Mac. Um, he did a honey extraction demo over here. And uh, this is just the remainder that were left. We, and that's his honey house. I largely want you to get the honey house. And he's got a stove in there, a heater, that, uh, a wood-burning heater. And he's got his beehives over here. And this is on the Route 30. The Route 30 in Exton. So if anyone knows, you can stop by. And he sells his honey here. Okay. That's his honey. On a box, just behind there. Okay. And on a box, people take the honey, they put the money in there, and they go. Okay. And they see his bees, and then they buy the next day, the next day. So he does an amazing trade over here. Bees out in the front, and there's Johnny Mac. And uh, yeah. This over here is a nice photograph of one of our premier bee plants. This over here flowers a little bit later, July the 11th. Okay, please remember that this is important. Uh, it does have a trap for the bees, though. This is the common milkweed. You can see the bee. Uh, they grow about this size, and uh, the bees go. It was important. Um, the, the pod that emanates from this was used for life, life jackets and for parachutes. Okay, so um, anyway, during the Second World War. Next. Okay. <clears throat> One of the important things is package bee failures. Okay, I think a lot of you might have had problems with package bees. In 2014, our area, the Pennsylvania, had 68% failure. Okay. So when you, your package bees fail or they just leave, it is happening to almost everyone. Okay. So remember, package bees are not the way to go. Uh, very often the queens die. Uh, there's often queen supersedure. Swarming after introduction, which is almost unnatural. I mean, they should not be swarming. Uh, drone laying queens, I mean, that is very common. But how can a beginner know that it's a drone laying queen? This is the whole thing. For beginners over here, it is devastating. You buy your bees, you put them in, and they leave. They die. Something happens. It's not nice. Okay. What we want to emphasize, one of the major goals that we have here is to have local queens and you have your own bees. You do not import bees. You do not import the, import the diseases from your varroa, the viruses that are coming up. So package bees are something that we should not be doing. Okay, this is my opinion. <laughs> Some of you might think differently, but we need to emphasize local queens and nucleus hives and surviving nuclear hi nucleus over the winter, nucleus hives over the winter. The last season, Okay, I've got to brag a little bit now because I might not be able to replicate this ever. The last season, uh, my production hives that through the winter time, I lost zero. Okay, wow. nothing. Okay, nucleus hives, I had 35 nucleus hives going through winter. Nucleus is a five frame deep. Okay, nothing else. Five frame deep in a plywood, half inch plywood box. 30 out of 35 survived. Okay. Is this sustainable beekeeping? This is definitely sustainable beekeeping. This is what you should be doing now. You should be concentrating on doing this type of stuff to make your bees survive. We do not want your bees to die. And as Mel was saying early on, one of the most important things, treat for Varroa. Those of you who are not treating for Varroa are spreading diseases to the rest of us. Now, I'm pretty vocal about this, and I'm pretty angry now, because on Sunday, I have to, I work for a living. I work to pay for my beekeeping hobby. On Sunday, I've treated all my hives. I'm expecting a bit of free time now. I went to one of my apiary sites, and they are massed with Varroa. They are absolutely inundated with Varroa. And I've treated them. I've treated them completely, killed everything. 98% effective, killed everything. Okay, I come back now, 
What are they doing? They're robbing somebody else's hive that is not looking after their bees, and I am just inheriting it. So I have virtually now got to go back and retreat. Otherwise, my hives will not survive the winter. Okay, they will not survive the winter. So um, <clears throat> it's, it's something, if you on the non-treatment, the natural beekeeper, let my bees die, okay, uh, don't do it, okay. If you have a dog, okay, are you going to let your dog uh, die because there are too many fleas? And they say, I want the dogs, I want a good dog that can handle fleas, okay. Yeah, the fleas are swapping, or ticks, or uh, whatever it is. We've got mites over here. So, um, package bee failures, we should be looking at queen rearing over here. So, what we've done with the club, and this is probably for me one of the most exhausting times, is that uh, the queen rearing. Okay, we started a queen rearing project. We elected a champion of the queen rearing project. And he was due to start, and we had everything organized, and we bought queens from all over the place, and we researched it, but he suddenly said no. At the end of June, he said no. Okay. So I took over the queen rearing part of it, and I produced over 150 queens. Okay. Um, what we do is we scour everything, and this is where the clubs must get together. We look at feral colonies. We look at survivor genes. We look at bees that can survive. We found two very, very good candidates. The one was what we call the Pew gene. And that was, had survived for about 40 years. Okay? We always hear the story, survived 40 years, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, we got to look at it. Okay? So we look at it, we open it up, we destroy somebody's house to have a look at it. Okay? If I find wax moth, wax moth means what? That you forget it, okay? That means uh, if I find an uh, old wax moth, okay, that dig the hole in the wood, it means that the colony has died, the wax moth has moved in, and that is not the same queen that has been on there for a long time. Most of them have got very, very good evidence of wax moth digging, and you'll see the different shapes. So you can see wax moth on wax moth on wax moth. That colony has died at least three or four times, okay? And swarm has moved into the same location. Every now and again, we pick up good genes, okay? Good feral genes. We have got the Pew genes and we've got the Nemours genes. The uh, Nemours genes was accurately documented that uh, the Nemours mansion, you know the Nemours mansion where next to the DuPont hospital or the DuPont family, they've got bees there and they were untreated and they didn't know what to do, but they survived. Okay, they survived and they survived year upon year upon year upon year with nothing. No one was looking after them. Okay. Until we got wind of this and we said, let's look at them. They had been, and they had been documented all the time. They were taking notes but didn't want to go into them. And they had survived all, over all of this varroa that obviously swarmed and everything. But we got those genes, which turned out to be <laughs> quite, uh, quite, uh, quite warm, or let's, uh, let's say hot. <laughs> you go next to them, they see me coming from a mile away and they will, they will look for me. <laughs> yeah, so it's... Uh, what we do is we graft from these, and we choose selective genes. Uh, we use different apricots, different queens. We, we graft from them, and we produce um, 150 queens that will survive our area. We need local stuff. We create drones. All our members create drones. We tell them, make drones. Okay. We're going to make the queens. We hand out queen cells. We give instructions of how to use the queen cells, how to insert them, and we sell them for five dollars each. When I produce queens, I produce them, I feed them honey. Okay, they get honey. On the production side, most of the genetics that we have is not really genetics, it's actually the feeding of the honeybee during the process of creation. They get fresh pollen, they get special um, uh, uh, protein feed. These things are worth forty dollars, not five dollars over here. So when we create these queens, now one of the anomalies that we had, and this is what really almost killed us, is that um, the Namur strain that we had developed these tiny, tiny little queen cells. And uh, we were thinking, we've, we've done something wrong. We're done, and we couldn't believe this. But when they hatch, this huge monstrosity comes out of the thing. Okay, then what I did as an experiment on the next batch that I did is I took a standard Italian for our beginners, so I took Italian and I took Nemours genes and I put them in the same hive. Okay. 
to be developed. The Nemours genes, now this is, this is amazing. The Nemours genes, the queens were tiny. The Italian ones were huge in the same hive. How does that work? Okay, so I took the Italian ones out. Oh, lovely, big. It looks like an elephant trunk on this thing. Then I look at Nemours dream. Then I've got to use a magnifying glass. When they come out, they look the same. Okay. So we're doing a lot of the queen rearing. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, we made mistakes. I made mistakes. I normally make about 40 queens a year for myself. Okay. Now I've got to ramp this up to 150. I learned a lot. Okay. One of the major mistakes that I did was I let other people graft. Never let other people graft. When you graft, you graft. Okay. In other words, you take the larval stage that is a day old, you take that out and you graft it into a cell. Okay. Then you put that cell onto one of these special frames over here. You can see there's the frame with a metal insert over here. Then that is a little cup over here. Why do you not let somebody else graft? Because they will graft the larval stage that is not correct. And that messes everything up. They will hatch early. They will kill everything else. So you've got to be really, really diligent with that. And I made that was my mistake. It took me a while to realize it. I just stupidity. Okay, now we're doing a, a, a grafting session. So we all go and we start grafting. I graft the first two um, frames like this. Then we give it to the others to graft. But if they go in the same hive, those queens are going to hatch earlier. They're going to destroy everything else. So they're taking larval states that are four days old. They cannot see the small. You need a magnifying glass. Okay. So we run through all these things, and I've learned now that I'm going to, in future, ask them to graft in a, on a piece of leaf, or maybe graft uh, on something else, okay? And not into a queen cup, okay? Those are things that go in the hive, <laughs> unless I can look at it and say if it's okay. But what happened is, one queen hatches, it destroys everything. So we lose queens, okay? So then we get queen cages, we put these cages on, so the queen, when it hatches, can be fed by the workers, but kept intact. Okay, then what we do is we hand these out to our members. So they come to a central location, we hand it, they come and collect them, off they go. They insert it in their nucleus hives or their main hives and out pops a queen over here. That's just a cell. That's a cell. We're not using the queen. The cell goes into your hive. Right. We'll give you the date. It's normally day 14. Okay. And the other thing that happened is we had extremely hot weather. Um, uh, I do a lot of traveling for my work, and uh, I had to come back, and we had heat wave. So I was making it during the heat wave. They hatch early on a heat wave. So while we were handing them out, these queens were hatching <laughs> right in front of you. Just the, they were hatching. And their main goal is to kill the other ones. So you have these crazy ones running around. <laughs> this over here <clears throat> is an important thing. Uh, we've got uh, some of our members that were first in line with the uh, oxalic vapor, oxalic acid vapor, uh, before it was recognized and made legal here in the U U.S. Uh, they were giving talks on this, and this is something, anything that kills a varroa is good. Okay. A lot of the demise that you have in your colonies are because of varroa. Varroa is the big enemy. You control varroa, your bees are very easy to manage. Okay. This over here is the oxalic acid vapor. Uh, it is, uh, the benefits are it's really inexpensive. The negative sides are it takes a huge amount of time to do 50 or 60 hives. You're going in and you're putting it into every single hive. It does take a long time and you've got to do it three weeks. This over here is the setup. You notice that that there is a foam. That is the vaporizer. Uh, in that goes two grams or in the case of a nuke one, that'll be one and a half grams over here. That's a nucleus hive. It goes and sits on this. That burns. Oxalic acid goes into this, kills all the mites, the phoretic mites. You keep a smoker going that you can see the direction of the wind so you don't sniff the stuff. Although on YouTube it looks as though people enjoy sniffing that stuff. <laughs> don't follow the YouTube videos, whatever you do. Then what you have over here, that's my little bottle of oxalic acid. It costs almost nothing. Yeah. That's it, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's it. So uh, that fits, uh, the nuke fits directly onto that. So everything goes up into it. So. And uh, that's onto a battery. So <clears throat> the battery runs there, goes for two and a half minutes, and uh, sits alone for, uh, five, for 10 minutes. 
that is a bucket with water that you will dip the heated one in so you can quickly go on to the next one. So you can see my nuke boxes. My nuke boxes over here are plywood. The Coates uh, plywood nuke that you make uh, <coughs> in about five minutes. Next. This over here is just an illustration of what we do in our club members. You can see extracted demos. It was a very, very hot day, so half our members went to the left, half went to the right. <laughs> okay. So this over here, honey extraction, nucleus hive kits, demos, uh, what the open hive, uh, lindens, all these things, um, the, all the different things that we do. Yeah? Extracting honey in the open field there? Um, it's called an uh, inverter. Uh, car. Uh, if you ask uh, any guy here, they will say, yeah, uh, bring my truck in. There'll be a truck here. Well, is the inverter in there? Uh, yeah, plug it in. Uh, this runs on 12 volt. So he's rigged up a 12 volt attachment as well. Yeah, but how do you keep the bees from... <laughs> you just do one set. Okay, one set. You oh. don't do that normally. As soon as a bee comes, you stop. It's just to show people. It's, it's, it's not... Uh... Right. This is a really, really good idea. So what we did... Okay. What we did over here is we got some members together and said, we're going to make nucleus hives for our members. Okay. So what we did is bought sheet, uh, what's it, 10 sheets of plywood, half-inch plywood, and we spent a whole day cutting this into pieces, and we put it into kits, okay. uh, assemble kits. We labeled each one, and we got all together, and we sold these for cost, the cost of the plywood, for $6 each. So we made 40 of these, okay? And it's got a bottom board, it's got, it's a bolted on. This is good for a toolbox. This is good to catch a swarm. This is good. I overwinter bees in that. That my nucleus hive survive in that thing, okay? Uh, granted, I do a little bit extra to it, but <laughs> I put candy boards and everything else. But that over there is one of the initiatives that we did, okay? So that's an initiative that we looked at. And uh, we delivered that. Uh, it's very useful for the club. Next, um, we had 200 of these. Okay. Another nucleus hive. We want people to overwinter nucleus hives. So you don't buy package bees. You've got a surplus. Okay. So if you need, if your queen doesn't handle that well, you throw a nucleus hive into it. You put the frames, a bit of newspaper, boom. That there will explode. You will get, you will get they will go crazy. Okay. There'll be so much honey, you need that tap on the end there to, to, to <laughs> offload it. Okay, so we sold those for $16 each. That is a top, a bottom, everything. And this is from, I think you all know, Ike. Do you all know Ike? Forest Hill Woodworking? Yeah, Ike. So, uh, and for the club members, buy in bulk. Get a huge discount. We even sponsor it. We want people to get them. So we pay them to take these. So this over here is, uh, I think it's normally about 20-something dollars. You, you can look at the website, but uh, we're sponsoring this. We want people to use this. Is that, that's inexpensive. Next. Are your overwinter nukes productive the next in the spring? We had a very bad winter this last time. About 50% were amazing. 50% were very slow to start out. So there's a mixed bag. Some of my nucleuses um, delivered over 100 pounds of honey during the season. So some of them delivered very, very, very well. Then I breed from those ones. This over here is clover. This is white sweet clover. Grows tall. Uh, you notice a bee over there. I hope it's my bee. But <laughs> Next. This over here is the electronic hive scales. One of the initiatives that we did was we got hive scales for our members. Okay? And this is what it looks like. So this is a drawing of every single day, how it goes up and down, and the arrow over here points to um, when it goes up in weight. So you can see the, the increase over here as they um, get to a certain, as they're bringing in honey during the night time, as they're curing the honey, notice it goes down. And uh, it is absolutely amazing watching this. So we can tell our members and say, hey, there's a flow on. Put the super on. Put it on now. Do you yeah? do also like a, an x-axis with temperature? Yeah, uh, it's below on this over here, so it's got temperature. The ones now have got impact, two hives. Though, with like higher temperatures and decline it is weight. absolutely amazing because you've got humidity, rainfall, and you will see rainfall. When rainfall comes on, you'll notice that the nectar goes down. All the bees suddenly rush back in. And also, one thing we didn't realize is that uh, when the bees go out, your hive loses weight. 
<laughs> so the bees leave, yeah. The foragers go out yeah, and it gets lighter. <laughs> You'd have water coming in, so when you see the water coming in, it gains a bit. This is fascinating. This gives you an insight that we've never had before on the bees. We know that the black locust flow is a morning flow. Okay, did we know that? Did any of us know this? We're looking now and saying, okay, here, yeah, you're going to get this in the afternoon. We can tell exactly when it is, how it is, what is happening. Are they going to swarm? This will tell you. So it draws exactly every five minutes, gives you a wait. Over here. Okay, next. This over here is a longer duration. This over here is uh, from 1st of June all the way to July the 14th, the main flow. Look how linear that is. That is amazing. Look, look how that's going up. Obviously, big flow starts. In certain times, it's big. Then maybe bad weather, then big. Uh, but you can see it is sort of following a certain curve. This over here, anise hip, hyssop, um, this over here is a good bee plant, uh, just <laughs> the flowering. Uh, this will determine when you plant it. Okay. Um, these are the hive crawl. So what we do with our members is we say we're going to hold a hive crawl and we will position the location. So in other words, we start there, we will go there, then we go there, then we come there, there, then there. We give times of all of them. Uh, we notice that we have to make it along so if the drive takes uh, let's say uh, 10 minutes we make that one 30 minutes okay just gives you time to get out everyone asks questions and always make it longer so it's a huge if you do the whole thing it's a long long day but this is one of the things that our members found most valuable was the hive crawl going to different apiary sites and seeing how other people do it they might be they're often absolutely perfect except they might be missing one little piece out. Or they say, I have no varroa. Uh, you know how many times <laughs> uh, we've heard people, even in one of our big meetings, somebody will come up and say, I have no varroa. Okay, well, I s can I look at your hives? No, but I will send you a photograph when I first get my varroa. Okay. Then what happens is you get the photograph. I have found a varroa. It's a beetle. Okay. So now you know that people don't know what they're looking for. So if you can go on a hive crawl, in fact, on this hive crawl, the person over here, in fact, said, I'm very low on Varroa, and we lifted a few drone, <laughs> uh, the purple eyes out, and uh, he was treating within a week. Okay. He, was, he treated that day, actually, that day. He rushed around to, to actually get some treatment. He was so shocked uh, at the Varroa on his hive. So there we are. This over here is a hive crawl that just shows you what we do. We go through, we mark queens, we show how things are done. This is beautiful. Next. This over here is, uh, this is Luann's property. She's over there. And uh, you can see us going through an eight-frame box over there. Very nice colony. Next. Uh, this is, uh, we had uh, Jim's hives that we had to go through. We had to do this. Uh, Jim had left his hives and we had to uh, go through them. They were uh, evil bees, those. <laughs> Next, uh, this over here is just the different sites. There's Varroa on the, you can see, that's what we found. Uh, you can see the glove and they're all, uh, <laughs> that's a, a not that reliable way of looking at it, but that's a Varroa there, on a Varroa, and that's not a very old um, uh, drone. Those are the hives before we went in. This over here is the same location. Um, then we went to the next location, we weighing hives. Um, this is uh, Don uh, showing us how to do it. Um, <laughs> this is me. <laughs> this is quite humorous. Okay, this is moving hives. Okay, so this is moving hives in the dark. So we are moving hive. The the guy who's taking the photographs, uh, photograph is dressed totally in everything. Okay, he's absolutely dressed in gloves the whole lot. The moving hives you generally get stung, you know. And uh, what we said, he says, I'm going to take a photograph. So Jim. And I was standing together like this, pitch dark. He said, okay, let's take the photograph. And he took the photograph. <laughs> that shot popped out. There's Jim. There. He turned around and went back to his hive uh, instead of uh, uh, at least posing for the photograph over there. So that's moving hives. Uh, this over here is just checking hives. Uh, let's go back one. Okay, th this is quite nice. You can see these are Russian bees. You can see, yeah. Uh, they, <laughs> there were Georgian bees next to them, and they were trying to take over and moving heavy equipment to the other one. <laughs> next. 
Uh, you've all noticed the stripe on the back of the bee. Uh, do you know where that comes from? And we can see here's the plant, here's the bee caught in the act. That stripe is the jewel weed. So you see the jewel, it's still flowering now. So that jewel weed over there. This over here is the, uh, the goldenrod. Um, in our area, we don't get much of a goldenrod flower. It probably is confused with aster and so on. But these over here, the jewel weed. Yeah. This over here is uh, four flows, uh, just showing you how um, the feeding on a hive scale, you can see feeding, curing the water, but uh, not very much. Uh, this fall was a lot better than last year. This is actually last year's fall flow. So we issued to our members and said, hey guys, uh, please feed. Please feed. Your, your bees are going to die. And uh, just as an example, a feral colony, uh, just go back, that a feral colony, which I did a cutout, uh, removed the feral colony. They had less than a pound, less than half a pound of honey going into winter. So when you hear the saying, oh, let's leave the fall flow for the bees, that means you're just lazy. You're lazy to test your hive and know what they're actually doing. So last year, as what we had, as Harry was saying, it's, this over here is um, incredibly bad. Okay, so um, remember, you must know what happens in your, in your hive. Next. Uh, we've even had a newsletter. So this is what we do. We create a newsletter every month, much the same as you do. We send out, and then we get a president's report. We show what the bees are doing. Uh, what is happening over here, uh, what's happening, see oxalic blast and so on. And it's turned out into be five pages or so, where we now have the beginner guy coming in. We even have a plant guru who's a pediatrician. <laughs> and he's the plant guru. He's actually uh, in Glen Mills, and he produces plants and sells them to the public in his spare time. And uh, he's now our plant guru and has how many hives outside his uh, uh, property. The president's report, vice president, the, the secretary, the treasurer, everyone contributes to this. This over here is important. We call this the oxalic blast. And uh, I regard this as being one of the most important uh, events uh, of the calendar year. What we do is we do an ox oxalic acid dribble. Okay. We do this on, uh, this year it's going to be the 12th of December. So we study this in detail as the exact timing when we've got to deliver this. We may delay a week. Now, it depends on the weather from now till December as to when we do. But uh, oxalic acid dribble is probably the most important event of a beekeeper's year. Okay. As I've said, I do this. I have not lost a production colony in two years. In three years, I've lost one hive in three years. Okay. So mine work. Okay. Uh, people say, why do I experiment with trying something new? <laughs> so I'm trying new stuff all the time. But uh, this is something I've been doing for a long time. It's very, very easy. We'll show you now. It costs about a dollar to treat 30 hives. Okay. This over here is what we do. This is an oxalic acid. We do it all at the same time. We do it 12th of December. We all go out. We do it. We mix a huge amount of this stuff over here, which is sugar water with a bit of oxalic acid dissolved in it to a 3.2% mix or 2.9. I will determine what the mix will be before we go in. So we will mix this. We fill a syringe with 50 milliliters. If it's a big colony, it gets everything. If it's a small colony, it gets half. This over here decimates the varroa. Middle of winter, boom, pop it open, throw it in, close it, it's done. It is so easy. Okay. This over here is a must do. Okay. The problem being is it's slightly harsh on the bees. The next thing, oxalic acid. Now notice I wrap my hives. This is uh, the black tar paper. Okay. Uh, I don't think it's that important, but I think it's, I like doing it. It makes me feel as though I've done something. It's also a lot of work to do. One of the things I do with my hives is I put uh, a insulation on the top. I think it's one inch or three quarter inch, that blue stuff there, or it's pink stuff, depends where you get it from. That goes over the inner cover, and that goes in. And I feed candy as well. Okay, so next one here is another example of guys going crazy with oxalic acid. You'll notice that people are a little bit cold. Um, you will get stung if you don't, get, you don't wear a suit. Those bees come out, and they have to sting. Okay, so you lose a few of the bees. This over here is uh, just going through what we should be doing now in October. And uh, I hear some of you say, don't feed. Okay. I feed like crazy, okay? I feed until they cannot have any more, 
Okay. I harvest sugar water honey for my nukes next year. So those who don't feed, my bees are going to survive. They're going to be happy when it's cold and miserable and damp. Mine are sitting there enjoying life. They're saying, they're pulling tongues at all of you. Okay. But I make sure they've got space. All the time, I make sure my bees have space. At the moment, the important thing is I want the queen still to be laying. Any eggs that have been laid right the way up to now are the future of your beehive. Those are the ones that are going to survive later on. Mine is a little bit unorthodox. What I do in September, September I start feeding one-to-one -one sugar syrup. Okay. In September, I feed one, one part sugar to one part water in September to build the numbers up of my bees. Okay. I then harvest it. I never let them get honey bound. And what is also very good is I make them draw out the frames. So I use them, so I got drawn frames next year. Okay. With sugar water, not with honey. So I'm saving time with that. This over here in September as well, I feed them one to one because it's easier to mix. <laughs> it's easy. I'm lazy. Yeah. So they cure it. They've got the heat of September. They cure it. And I build up the numbers of my bees. October over here, no, I would not feed anything except two to one. Okay. If I am feeding, what I do is I go excessively. My big hives get to 100 pounds. Yeah, I bring mine to 100 pounds. Okay. The standard over here in this area would probably be, they would survive on 60 pounds. In the springtime, I harvest my sugar water honey. It is invaluable for your nukes. You put it into a nuke box when you're creating the nukes. They've got food. Okay. They're the ones that are normally susceptible. So you use your, you don't extract them. So November over here, you order new equipment. You end the late fall feed if you're lucky. You've got to be careful with this. Next we have uh, feeding. Uh, this is the way I feed. I feed these out apiaries. I've got seven apiary sites. I feed with a four-gallon feeder. Okay. When I come in, I mix 30 gallons in a big uh, tank that I buy from a tractor supply company. It's got a hose, an electric motor. I go over here, I put it in there, and it pumps sugar water into that. Brilliant. I love it. I can do it even from my car without getting out. Okay, that's what we want. Yeah, that is so cool. 30 gallons. Then I take uh, uh, another 15 gallons just in little bits and I throw it in. These are wonderful. The ones with the ladders over here, they're gorgeous. The bees go in, uh, not that much robbing. The problem here, that seal, you've got to seal that nice, otherwise every little critter will creep into there. So this over here, 100 pounds. Do you use fumagillin for Nosema or not? Do you prophylact prophylactically treat them or not? This is a huge debate that we look at. Um, and uh, uh, again, you must, your bees must have time to cure the sugar water into the right uh, concentration over here. Now we go to the next, and uh, this is the Varroa. So those of you who haven't seen Varroa, I took a series of photographs here just to, or I uh, took some photographs. You can see on the bees. Um, I see this on one of my colonies on Sunday. Okay, I see this. This is normally means a colony cannot survive. Okay, they are picking huge amounts of this from other colonies. Okay, I try. My tolerance for Varroa is zero okay if i get one percent infestation i treat okay a lot of people don't do that my bees survive okay it's like the old days your bees survive these are the varroa the bro on a bee you can see what it looks like close up of a varroa you won't see it on the bees often it's very when they're really infested you would see it this is varroa and this is exactly this is what we had from mill over here and uh, again comparing to vaccination you can see the vaccination over here the treatment-free crowd, as we know, uh, creates a reservoir for Varroa to, thri to thrive and reinfest healthy colonies. So what's happened to me on my apiary site? Exactly that. Exactly that. Somebody doesn't treat. Yeah, their bees die. Okay, that's fine. I've got packaged bees next year. Okay? They live and let, live and live and let die approach is not working, and Varroa is the biggest problem than ever. Uh, Mahler, Spivak, and again, exactly what Mahler Mahl, uh, Mahl said, Listen to Marla. <laughs> okay. So uh, if Marla talks, you listen to it. Okay. It is really, really important. Okay, next. This is a debate. Uh, I don't think this is a major thing for winter. Um, this is wrapping your hives. I do it because 
I think it does a little bit benefit. The most important thing is treating for Varroa. The second most important, well, I'd say the most important thing is feeding it. Make sure they've got food. Uh, I think feeding is more important because if you look, feeding, a colony can never survive if it doesn't have enough food. They will die. If they don't have food, they will die. Uh, the next one is Varroa. Treat for Varroa. Make sure. Can you do oxalic acid treatment now? Yes, you can do it now. Would it be more likely that your bees will survive? Yes, it would be more likely. I use a cover. You can see that insulation there. I use this. I have open screen bottom boards. Mine are open screen. Okay. Even my nuke boxes have open screens down below, so they get a nice draft of cold air up. And what I do is I slit this over here, and I fold it under the hive. So the black tar paper goes under the hive. So I fold it. You saw the parcel on the top. I do a parcel on the bottom, and I put a strap around all of them. Okay. And I close them up with candy. I use candy boards at the top. And I can leave my bees. Just leave them. It's done. Leave them to their own devices. They're never going to die. 100 pounds of honey? Yeah, two winters. Okay. Uh, but uh, this over here is feeding. Don't use those things. What is that thing called? It, it, it means don't do that. Okay. Especially in the dearth period, which means your hive's going to get robbed. Okay. So when they sell that to beginners, they're saying, oh, let your colony die. Why is it going to die? It's going to go robbing. Yeah, they just go crazy with the robbing. So if you use one of those, put it inside. This is a nice little, little cardboard, a wind deflector. What I maintain is I think the wind, the, the reason why we use this over here is uh, the wind. Go stand next to it. When the wind is blowing, it is cold. It is absolutely freezing. This over here, I think, is, is largely wind protection. Everyone talks about solar gain. I think solar gain is good. It heats up in the sun. And what happens is it warms the layers and the air going in and around the bees. One of the most important things is your top entrance. Always remember, wintertime, put in a top entrance. Probably one of the most important things. This over here, windbreaks. You can see somebody putting a windbreak. Uh, this is uh, some nice bales. Uh, they're very good for, uh, for deer, so deer can eat it as well. They don't starve. And also for something that goes into the hive, it's very good for attracting mice. Yeah. <laughs> so whether you use that, the, the wind guards, mouse guards over here, which ones do you use? This is called a cheapskate version. Go into Home Depot, you pick up that. It's, uh, I think, the drywall corners. <laughs> it works well. <laughs> this works well. Those are really nice. This is what I do sometimes. I do that. So the bees can go in and out. Those are nails. Okay? And uh, this over here is a really fancy one, if you've got the money. Yeah. This over here is use a hive strap. Okay. How many of you use just that piece of uh, concrete on the top, like, or stone, or a brick on the top? You know how many times your hive, if your hive falls over in winter, it's dead. It's, it's dead. Uh, it's gone. But what you do is you put a strap over it. Okay, you buy these for next to nothing at my favorite store, which is the Chinese tool company, which is called what? Harbor Freight, yes. Why? Because you buy it for, let's say, $3, and then you get a 40% discount. So it's like, <gasps> my Scottish heritage has come to the fore. Harbor Freight, brilliant. You tie a strap around that. You don't have to have the ratchet ones. You can just do a tension it. That branch will come over here. That beehive will still be there. The branch will be broken. That is one of our members, by the way, that lost, he lost four hives in that branch falling. That is in that ice storm that we had uh, two years ago. This is what I believe in, candy boards. Okay. Candy boards are brilliant. Okay. You melt this. Uh, I've got the recipe over here. I make a shim. That shim over there, even open and closed, if I put candy in there and I set it on newspaper inside a towel, I can take that off without an inner cover and it will hold when the candy is set. You've got to bring the candy up... Um, uh, in a pot for 234 degrees and maybe a little bit above that, and then it sets rock hard. Okay, brilliant stuff. The main reason why we do that is supplementary feeding. Now, my goal, okay, now I see this is not maybe everyone's goal. If my bees are strong in March, okay, and I have them fed on candy and they have ample honey, they accelerate far faster than if they don't have it. They are booming. 
Okay, so right in the very beginning of the season, I make sure they are overfed. They are overcandied. That's why I can get my 100 pounds per hive. How much do you sell your honey for? Per pound. How much are you getting? I know some guys are getting 12. Okay, maybe $10. How much if I get 100 pounds and I'm selling for 10 dollars a pound how much is that worth for you okay one hive okay can you do that okay so this over here candy board making candy here's the recipe you can look this up it's dangerous if you put your head in there when it's hot you'll die okay so don't put your head into the candy i know you're very tempted to do that because it tastes brilliant yeah it is very very hot you can burn yourself with this make sure water's there and uh, i give my an average 10 pounds each okay of candy because it absorbs moisture. One of the killers of the bees is the moisture that you will have over there. Okay, next. Uh, I weigh my hives. Okay, I use a fishing scale. You can use one from um, uh, Walmart. I think it's $6.70. Okay, uh, that might be a bit too expensive for, you know, the, if you're from Scottish Heritage or one of those. <laughs> but uh, this over here is my old fishing scale. And uh, I hook at the back, hook in the front. I know what the weight is. Add the two together. It might not be perfectly accurate, but I know throughout the season what is happening. Keep a record of it. Everything is recorded. I know exactly how much the hives are weighing. Uh, that's, and that's over there is my hive scale there. That's an English design there. And uh, yeah, uh, biggest fish. This is 220 pounds. Uh, <laughs> more than the scale could handle. <laughs> I've got to brag somehow. Next. Uh, this over here is the new threat. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, every season we have a new threat. Okay, something happens to our bees, whether it's a new virus from our varroa. But this next year coming up, we have got a brand new threat. The threat that we have is called the zombie. Okay, because now what happens over here is the zombies have, in fact, gone under the snow. And we'll find that we have <laughs> infected bees. So now we've got new zombie bees. So this is the new threat that we have. We haven't found out how to solve it yet, but these are the zombie bees are now. Okay. <laughs> Next. <laughs> uh, maybe I've been watching too much of the, the boring dead. Uh, sorry, the walking dead. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but this over here is configuration. This is what I do in winter. I am doing this now. Okay. So we quickly go through what I do. Okay. First of all, this is what your hive looks like. Whether 8 frame or 10 frame, mine or 10 frame, the cluster is generally there. I put a queen excluder there but just to show you I'm taking it out. And I have an inner cover and a top cover and my bottom board has disappeared. I don't know where it went, but yeah. Anyway, what I do now is I go here. I go through all my hive and I put the honey in the top. 10 frames of pure filled capped honey. Um, normally what I do is I use three boxes, sometimes four boxes at this stage. And I fed in September. Of capped sugar, yeah. yeah. That's all. So I've got capped sugar. So I don't extract it. <laughs> so, so that over there is capped sugar water. By the way, capped sugar water or sugar wa uh, honey made from sugar water. Now, a lot of the older beekeepers are going to kill me with this. But the Canadians have, they do extreme, uh, extreme wintering. They will remove all honey, all natural honey. And what they will do is they will feed sugar water because they overwinter better on pure cane sugar okay so a lot of you will say i don't want to do that i give them natural honey but they do not need to go to the restroom as often with pure cane sugar they survive better on sugar feeding than honey feeding now this is contrary to what the old beekeepers will tell you but anyway uh, anyway the honey goes there okay i put the cluster down below in other words i put the frames in exactly the same order that they appear there and normally they're a little bit here, a little bit there. I try and put them as much as possible, frames aligning each other, and the cluster goes there now. The next part that we have over here, candy board. Okay, 12th of December, candy board, honey, that, and remember there's a bottom board as well. Do I leave my screen bottom board open? Yes. But the, the wrap goes around so that they're protected. You don't want wind going up. Okay, this is how... I